Hello and welcome back to Patrick Boyle on Finance. Today we're going to be talking about the Wall Street Journal article that came out yesterday on levered ETNs and the investors who've seen their retirement savings evaporate because of them. We'll learn about what they are and why it might be wise to avoid these types of products. Stay tuned until the very end and I'll explain why a two times leveraged ETF doesn't actually give you twice the long term return of the index it's tracking, just twice the one day return. Okay, so yesterday's Wall Street Journal had an article by Akan Otani called Bankrupt in Just Two Weeks, Individual Investors Get Burned by the Collapse of Complex Securities. In it, the writer tells the stories of a number of investors, many of whom were retirees who saw their savings wiped out by the collapse of leveraged ETNs. So let's talk about what these products are and why they might be unsuitable for many portfolios. The article starts out with the story of William Mark, an investor who needed to play catch up in his retirement account after the credit crunch 12 years ago. He found a levered ETN that earned him 18% a year on average in dividends a year, and he invested $800,000 of his savings into this product. And then during the coronavirus sell off, he ended up losing almost 100% of his investment. The guy in the story is 67 years old and basically bankrupt. So what on earth are these products and how did it all go so wrong? What had happened is William had invested in a leveraged ETN issued by UBS that invested in mortgage REITs. So let's unpack that and see what that means. A REIT, as many of you probably already know, is a real estate investment trust. Most REITs own property and rent it out, and then the IRS requires REITs to pay out at least 90% of their taxable income to shareholders. Now, mortgage REITs are a little bit different. Mortgage REITs provide financing for income producing real estate by purchasing or originating mortgages and mortgage-backed securities or MBS and earning income from the interest on these investments. So that's kind of quite a bit different to at least a lot of people's idea of what a real estate investment trust is. And then an ETN, the, the thing that it was packaged in, an ETN is an exchange traded note, which is similar to an ETF that many of you probably heard of, which is an exchange traded fund, in that they trade on a stock exchange and track a benchmark index. However, an ETN is a senior unsecured debt security issued by a bank. It doesn't hold the underlying securities the way an ETF does, and the return on an ETN is linked to a market index or other benchmark. An ETN basically promises to pay at maturity the full value of the index minus the management fee. Like any other debt security, the investor is of course subject to the credit risk of the bank that issues it in, in the product in question, it was UBS. ETNs were actually developed in around 2006 by Barclays Bank uh, to make it easier for retail investors to invest and to maximize the returns in hard to access instruments, particularly in the commodity and currency areas. By moving to a debt structure, Barclays eliminated the costs associated with holding commodities, currencies, and futures, and improved the tax structure for investors. An ETN is essentially a bet on the index's direction guaranteed by an investment bank. So of course you have to worry about the investment bank's credit risk. And as the index moves, so does the ETN. The financial engineering underlying ETNs is similar to the financial engineering that investment banks have long used to create structured products. And I've already created a video explaining what structured products are and how they work, and I will link to that up there. ETNs are different from ETFs because they don't own the underlying assets that their return tracks. They're just unsecured debt obligations of the issuing bank. So the product in question was a double leveraged ETN, which means that it gives an investor not just exposure to this underlying instrument, but two times leverage to an index comprised of REITs 
that hold U.S. residential and commercial mortgages. Now, the article doesn't name the specific ETN, but there are two tickers that roughly match the description. One is M-O-R-L and the other is M-R-R-L. I'm not sure which of them or if it even was one of those two products, but they certainly match the description in the Wall Street Journal article. So who invests in these things? Well, it's usually retail investors. Um, large asset managers, uh, fund managers, professional investors tend not to invest in these products, largely because the fees are quite high, there's a lack of transparency, and the kind of exposure that you can get from this is maybe just not that attractive to a professional investor. So why do investors want to invest in these products? Well, it's a little bit like the structured product video I did, where essentially investors are usually looking for some sort of savings account type thing. But since the financial crisis, and even before then with interest rates being very low, uh, there's not really an awful lot of attractive products for that type of investor. And they started looking around for products that looked a bit like bonds, but at higher returns. And these things seem to kind of uh, meet their needs. Now, of course, the problem with these is that the returns are much higher and therefore the risk is. And an investor should know, like this guy who invested and saw that the returns, I think, his average return was 18% and in certain years he had returns at 24% maybe. He, he should have known that that type of return is the return of a risky product. There are a lot of people arguing that this type of product should maybe be less accessible to retail investors. And that was kind of the argument in the Wall Street Journal article. Now, it's not just investors who actually lost money in this space so far in 2020. Many of the banks that structured these products lost money as well. Uh, it listed Societe Generale, BMP Paribas, and the taxes, all French banks, each lost over $200 million in their structured product businesses so far this year. Now, in the past as well, these things have run into problems. In 2012, regulators sanctioned banks for failing to educate investors about the risks of leveraged ETFs. And even this year, Wells Fargo paid $35 million to settle claims that its financial advisors recommended inverse ETFs that were too risky for their retail clients. Another example that was given in the Wall Street Journal article was of a 78-year-old retiree just looking for basic income who invested in these products and lost $700,000. And that guy, uh, the article said, is suing his broker for not adequately disclosing the risk. So as you can imagine, some of these products have disappeared, uh, but a lot of the banks are actually issuing new ones to replace the ones that, that crashed. Uh, UBS has announced five new products to replace those that crashed just months ago. A lot of people who were talking about this article are pointing out that there's just a ton of conflicts when financial institutions sell structured products to retail investors. They're usually designed to look appealing with a big coupon, salespeople are paid very high commissions, and retail investors can't really understand the risks. And that's just bad all around. And that's something that I mentioned in, in the piece that I did on uh, structured products to begin with. So what is it about these products that goes so horribly wrong? Well, the first problem is usually when you take something that looks like a very safe stream of returns and lever it up, you no longer are left with a safe investment. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that something that can earn 18 to 25% a year is a risky investment. Just the returns tell you that there's risk there. In addition, leveraged ETFs lose out from compounding. So compounding, which is supposed to make investors rich in the long run, is actually what keeps leveraged ETFs from mimicking the indexes in the long run. And simple math can show you why leveraged ETFs don't necessarily give you the return you might expect. These products don't amplify the annual returns of an index, but instead what they do is they amplify the daily changes in the index. So let's suppose that the S&P 500 was to lose 10% on one day and then gain 10% the next day. So if the S&P, it's around 3,000 right now, if it lost 10%, that would mean that it fell by 300 points, which is 10% to 3,000 to 
to then 2,700. Now the next, if it went up 10% from 2,700, that would mean it went up 270 points. So now it's at 2,970, which is a total loss of 30 points from its starting point at 3,000. And 30 points just happens to be 1%. So when things go down and go back up by the same percentage amount, there's usually some sort of a loss in there. Now, these products aim to maintain a constant leverage ratio, typically two times or three times. And to do this is a little bit complicated. So fluctuations in the price of the underlying index change the value of the leveraged firm's assets. And this requires the fund to change the total amount of index exposure it has. So let's work through an example. Let's say if, uh, on a given week, if the market or the, the index loses 1% every day for four days in a row, then what it needs to do to get back to its starting point is to go up 4.1%. And that's just a compounding effect that I explained a few seconds ago. So it needs to go up 4.1% on the fifth day in order to get back to break even. A two times leveraged ETF would need the market to rally 4.21% on the final day to get back to even. And that's because the losses that it took on a leveraged amount, it then needs far greater gains to recover to get back. So while a one times leverage DTF needs to go up 4.1%, the two times leverage DTF needs the market to go up 4.21% in order to get back to break even. This isn't a rounding error thing, it's just a result of the proportionally smaller asset base in the leveraged fund, which would have been down 8.42% after the 4.1% down days. A three times leveraged ETF would be even worse. So as you can see here, the more volatile the market is, the more volatile the underlying is, the worse these leveraged ETFs do. Investors in addition pay usually much higher fees on these products than the management fee of a traditional ETF. And in addition to that, there's also this high level of trading associated with the daily rebalancing. And all of that just adds up to kind of bad returns for these products. And all of that is, of course, like the trading fees and the derivatives being traded are all passed through to the end investor. So leveraged and inverse ETFs are often tax efficient in addition to that. Uh, but of course, that varies by investor and by the account that they're investing in. Investors are, of course, notified of these risks if they read the fund's prospectus. The Velocity Shares 3 times leveraged crude oil ETN was a product that was issued by Citigroup. The prospectus says that it may not be suitable for investors who plan to hold for a period of time longer than one day. It noted that it is possible that you will suffer losses in the ETN even if the long-term performance of the applicable index is positive. So that is explained to investors, but the question is, does the type of person who invests in these products, do they actually understand what that means and how it works? Or that, that that's even a, a not, not like a, a possibility, but actually a likelihood. So an inverse leveraged ETF then, or ETN, uses leverage to make money when the underlying index is declining in value. So it gives you short exposure to whatever the underlying is. An inverse ETF rises when the underlying index is falling, allowing investors to profit from a bearish market or market declines. Now it's worth noting that these products are capable of going below zero if the index they're tracking goes up enough. And there was an example of this back in February 2018. The VIX index nearly doubled in a day, wiping out a popular inverse ETN, which was called the XIV. It's sort of VIX backwards XIV. And I think that was a Credit Suisse product and there was all sorts of drama around it because it was actually such a big product that when the VIX started moving that much, Credit Suisse had built into it a, a rule that, uh, that should more than 70% of the value of the ETN be destroyed, that, that it would then be liquidated. And so it's thought that a big part of the move in the VIX that day actually related to the liquidation of the XIV product. Now, an awful lot of people argue that these 
types of products should be less accessible to retail investors or that there should be a better risk disclosures because there's a lot of investment types that you, you might want to invest in, like derivatives and so on. And usually you have to sign off on a risk disclosure explaining that you understand the risks that you're taking and in investing in these products. And in many ways, uh, you know, it could be argued that some of these products are almost designed to give people these exposures without getting them to sign off on the risk disclosures or to necessarily fully understand the risks. Okay, well, if you found this video useful, do hit the like button below. Hit the subscribe and bell button if you want to see more content like this, all on finance or quantitative finance in general. Talk to you later. Have a great day. Bye.